You're listening to V&A Shipping, written and read by J.R. Murdoch. For more information, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com. <laughs> Once the Iron Butterfly's hull dipped through the acid rat's magnetic seal over the cargo bay, June let Tootsie land the ship and breathed a sigh of relief. We're back now. We're safe now. Joey obviously didn't share the sentiment. He eyed Mike's limp body warily. Can we put him in stasis now? June gave him a half-smile. Her body ached. She had anticipated Mike would attack her first, but she had no idea he would do so with such ferocity. It had taken every ounce of her strength to keep him off, and when Joey had climbed on top... Mike's fangs dipped within inches of her chest. She would have been dead long before the venom had a chance to do its evil work. Tootsie, do you have access to the stasis fields? Tootsie let out a small beep. Yes. Please suspend Mike until further notice. A grinding noise emitted from Tootsie. Done. Joey visibly relaxed and the iron butterfly settled down in the same location where it had taken off from. June waited. She had thought the doors would be closed right away, but that wasn't happening. Tootsie. Why are the cargo bay doors still open? Is something wrong? My sensors detect that Vic has accessed my control panel. He is not conscious. June wanted to get out of the ship, but couldn't. Not until the doors were closed. Can you close the doors and deactivate the magnetic seal? I have access to those functions. It appears that T11XR34Q14WMN912... Who is that? That is the computer of the Iron Butterfly. What about it? It cannot close the doors. But you can... And I am. June looked up. Indeed, the doors were closing. Slowly. June would relax when she was certain that Vic wasn't hurt. Joey suddenly looked ready to leave the ship. She had told Joey that nothing existed between her and Vic, that she looked to him like a big brother, but Joey only wanted to sulk, but with a little less aggressiveness to his sulking. June found his jealousy cute, but she would have to deal with him later. At least Joey still had his health. Once the doors were closed and the cockpit cover opened, June bounded out, Her arms and ribs screamed at her for doing so. Mike had punched her several times. She'd need to get checked out once this was all over. A flash of green escaped from the weapons room and flew up the ladder from the cargo bay. Dexter must have known something. June rushed up the ladder as quickly as she could, her arm protesting all the way. At the top, Dexter had Vic over his shoulder and escorted the incapacitated captain into the lounge. Argmon barked something from the cockpit. What? June had never really learned enough about Argmon's nuances of speech. She listened more intently the second time. He said something about police and approaching. They're back! They followed you back? Argmon chuffed agreement. Dexter, charge the engines! I'll get Vic and Joey strapped in. Argmon, get ready to go to hyperspace! Joey helped June strap in Vic. Um, this may sound like a stupid question, but doesn't this ship have something to, I don't know, make the police think we're in a different direction? Defensive countermeasures or something like that? You know what? I think I know just what to use. Argmon, ready the beacons. We've got to throw the ship off our trail, and now. Glad to see your back, something said. June didn't recognize the voice and instinctively reached for a blaster that wasn't there. Who's there? Jupnop, or she had to assume it was Jupnop, walked out from behind the couch on four stick legs. Several other branches projected from its back. Jupnop? Yes, it is me. You look different. Mike is... Yes, he attacked us. June strapped Vic in and then strapped herself in. She heard Dexter notify Argmon that the ship was ready. Argmon, use the hyperspace beacons. Set them for all different directions. Argmon barked back something. June assumed it meant agreement. Joey buckled himself in, as did Jupnop, his body no longer slime. He must require the dampening field now. Mike was in communication with someone he called the boss. The boss? About what? I never heard any specifics. I wonder if he's supposed to kill us all. I don't think so. Hey, June, I don't know much about what's going on here, but how long do we have to get back to Planchar? Aren't we running way behind on time? Hold on, Joey. One thing at a time. So, Jupnop, Mike was in communication with someone outside of the ship? How? Box in his web. Not sure how long. 
So you found this box? No, it was gone. Where? Don't know. The iron butterfly. If Mike had stowed away in the cruiser, it must be there. June grabbed at her seatbelt, but Joey reached for her. Don't! We're about to go into hyperspace! Can you answer my question now? Too much was happening at the same time. June wanted to deal with one thing, be it Vic, or Mike, or Mike's boss, or getting away from the police, just one thing. Being that she couldn't deal with any of those, she may as well deal with Joey. She smiled at him as best she could. Can you tell me your question again? How long do we have to get back? Tootsie, countdown until we need to arrive back on Planchar. Eight hours, forty-four minutes, forty-seven seconds. Thank you. June looked back at Joey. And? I think we can make it back in time. Joey, we took the fastest way here, and we had to take a detour. Vic lost time coming back for us. We don't have enough time to make it back. May as well accept it, bud. We lost this one. No, I think we can get back in time. I just need to talk to Argmon. We can do it. I tried to explain it to Vic, but he didn't think we could do it. Well, what makes you think we can? Well, we've got nothing to lose. It's worth a shot, isn't it? He was right. She'd just given up as soon as she'd heard Tootsie give the time. What did they have to lose? Okay, once we're in hyperspace, get up there with Argmon and see if you can give him the directions. Joey's boyish grin was infectious. June smiled back but resisted the urge to kiss him again. I don't want to hear excuses. I want the tractor beam locked on them, and I want it now. BT Justice fumed. Sir, we're not in range. Range schmange. If the range is a problem, move faster. Justice swatted the officer with his riding crop. Move, move. We're not losing them again. They had lost the SS Acid Rat, or its decoy, and found it again, then lost it again. But they had the other ship, the one that Justice was certain hid the SS Acid Rat's identity. Sir, that ship doesn't have hyper... Just move! Get me that ship or I'll have your badge! Do I make myself... Justice heard the collective gasp from those on board the ship. The ship slipped into hyperspace. Gone. Just like that, the crew of the SS Acid Rat slid through his fingers again. Plot their course! I want all drones set up to intercept them and pursue. Justice's scowl darkened the longer he glared at the star field on the screen. Now absence of the ship they were looking for. How could he have such an incompetent crew? Sir, they're headed for the Noir system. Isn't that... Yes, it's a black hole system. It's also near another black hole in a neutron star that's nearly a black hole in its own right. What are they thinking? What? The Munchkata system sat near a black hole system. Could it be that the captain of the SS Acid Rat felt so confident in his ability to navigate near such an anomaly that he fearlessly headed into the face of danger? B.T. Justice gripped his riding crop with both hands and nearly snapped it in half. Set course to follow. We're going after them. Sir? Set course. Justice's veins protruded from his reddened face. The officer turned back to his council and plotted the course that would take the apprehension dangerously close to the two black holes. The gravitational forces between the two stars could easily tear apart a planet. What would it do to a ship? It didn't matter. Whatever would occur would happen to the SS Acid Rat first. B.T. Justice snorted a small laugh. He wanted to be there when the ship was torn apart. He had to be there. Argmon growled and pushed Joey's hands away from the council. With Vic unconscious, the Shathar didn't want to take any instructions from Joey. But I'm telling you, we can make it back in time. With bared teeth intended to intimidate the boy, Argmon flexed his forearms and snarled. If Joey hadn't known Argmon, he'd be certain the beast could eat him. Calm down. I know you haven't tried anything like this before, but look here. June pressed a button on the council for Joey, and a display of the area appeared on the screen. See these two black holes? Joey pointed to the two black holes just on the outskirts of the standing blockade. We can use the first to speed us along and swing us near the second black hole, and then use the neutron star here to correct our course and bring us back on track to Planchar. With the gravity from the black holes and the neutron star, we should be able to gain enough speed. Argmon shook his head and growled. June magnified the map. Look here, Argmon. Right there. This is the course Joey plotted. 
It takes us close enough to the black holes to use their gravity, but stay far enough away so that we can pull away if anything goes wrong. Still, Argmon wasn't convinced. Tootsie, June called out. After a beep and a word, Tootsie said, Yes, June? Did you see the course that Joey plotted? Yes. What is your estimation of this course? It's dangerous. The ship may not hold up under the stresses of the acceleration. But it might, right? Would you like me to calculate the odds that the ship would survive? No! June yelled. I want to know if this course would give us sufficient speed to get us back to Planchar before the time is up. That's what I want to know. You're putting the ship in considerable danger. Tootsie! The computer went quiet, all except for a slight ticking noise. Joy smiled and put his hand on June's shoulder. She had done nothing but impress him since he'd arrived. Since she'd kissed him, Joy could think of little else. She returned a smile, and her pale blue eyes sparkled. Joy knew he'd been smitten, and he liked it. Tootsie interrupted his thoughts. The ship would arrive at Planchar with four minutes, thirty-two seconds remaining. June jumped up and hugged Joey. You're right! We can do it! Vic will be so proud of you! So proud of who? Vic asked as he staggered into the cockpit. And what are all of you doing up here? Argmon needs to fly this ship. Vic looked like hell warmed over, his face pallid and sweaty, his body slack as if he didn't even have the strength to remain standing. The fact was accentuated by Vic's hand on the wall to remain upright. June and Joey both moved out of the way and helped Vic sit down. He fell heavily into the chair. He rolled his head around and looked up at June. So, who am I supposed to be proud of? June beamed and held Joey's arm. Vic gave a disapproving frown, but didn't say anything. Joey found, and Tootsie verified, a way back to Planchar that'll get us back to the planet before the time expires. Vic's face twisted, and he looked back and forth between June and Joey. He focused on Joey. You did? Tell me. Joey couldn't read Vic's expression. Perhaps it was the poison. Perhaps he didn't look or sound hopeful. See these two black holes? Well, we can use their gravity. Joey explained the course, and even had Tootsie confirm it. All the while, Vic sat expressionless. When Joey finished, Vic crossed his arms on his chest. So you think everything will be okay? You don't think anything will happen to the ship? Or the crew? Well, there's no friction in space. But there's gravity. Vic struggled to sit up, but fell back into the chair. There's forces out there you don't understand. Black holes can tear a ship apart, and you want us to go up against two of them? Do you understand how dangerous it is? Vic pointed at Joey. Have you ever navigated a ship? Well... In my astronomy class, we... In class, kid. Not in real life. You're dealing with theory. This is real life. One miscalculation, and we're all gasping for breath in the great wide open. Kid, what you're proposing could kill us all. It could also get us back to Planchar on time. Kid, I don't like the odds. You don't even know the odds. I could calculate the odds. Joey and Vic yelled together, Shut up! June stepped in between them. Stop it! This arguing isn't getting us anywhere. Vic... We need to know right now. Have you given up on winning this little bet you took? I wasn't big on you taking it in the first place, but we're all in the same boat here. If we don't get back on time, we get nothing. I'd rather take home a nice prize. You did, after all, cause me to miss my appointment. Speaking of that, what did you have an appointment for? That's not important right now. What is important is, are you going to step up as captain of this ship and get us back on time, or are you quitting? Vic narrowed his eyes. I don't know that I like your tone. I don't care if you like it or not. Hey, I came back to save you from Mike. And now Joey and I are trying to help you save this mission. Vic sighed and looked at the floor. He looked defeated. Defeated physically, mentally, possibly spiritually. He'd failed to notice that Mike deceived the crew, nearly costing him his life. He failed to get the shipment back on time on his own. He'd let everyone down by being tailed by the police. When Vic looked up, his eyes were hollow and devoid of emotion. Argmon, set the course. Joey tried not to smile. The victory felt wrong and bittersweet. Joey only wanted to help. Instead, he made Vic look, and very likely feel, useless. Vic started to stand up, and Joey lurched forward, hesitated, then helped Vic stand up. I'm just going to go lay down. I don't feel so good. Okay. June said softly. Argmon narrowed his beady eyes at Joey, causing him to swallow hard. Maybe they'd all be happy once they made it to Planchar on time. Maybe. <laughs>
As Argmont entered in the course corrections to take the SS Acid Rat near the black hole, June helped Joey sit in Vic's seat. You stay here. I'm going to go and check on Vic. But... June pressed her finger to his lips. She was having a difficult time dealing with everything around them. She didn't want any words from Joey to confuse things. Just stay here and enjoy the view. Argmon may need help, but I doubt it. Either way, you stay up here. She kissed him on the forehead and left to go check on Vic. How did everything get so messed up? If that police cruiser hadn't followed them out of Bomda, and Vic hadn't taken this stupid challenge, and Mike hadn't been in cahoots with somebody he called the boss, none of this would have ever happened. Could someone really have planned for all this to happen? Could the person Mike contacted be orchestrating all this? No. Even if they had planned for months and months, they couldn't have expected all of these events to fall into place so well. No one could possibly plan anything that well and arrange for all the contingencies. June entered the captain's sleeping quarters. Vic had never kept anyone from sleeping in this room if they'd wanted to. He held a loose, almost flippant attitude when it came to formalities. He only expected for his orders to be obeyed. Beyond that, the crew had extreme liberty to do what they felt best. She and Joey had challenged Vic, and they hadn't done so lightly. They had taken away any little bit of self-esteem he might have had left after getting bitten by Mike. It was now her responsibility to talk to Vic and boost him back up. She'd only seen him sulk once before, and he could be a stubborn one. Vic? Vic? She asked softly as she entered the darkened captain's quarters. Vic had made the walls semi-transparent. He apparently wanted to watch the trip around the black holes. June hoped that boded well for this conversation. He didn't answer. Instead, he lay on the bed with his back to the door. She could feel that he wasn't sleeping. Vic, I need to talk to you. Still, he didn't respond. June pressed a button on the wall, and a padded shelf slid out from the wall next to the bed. She sat and put her hands on Vic's shoulders. He winced in pain. I need to check those bandages and change them before they dry and we have to rip them off of you. At least that sounded like a good excuse for her being here. I'm fine, Vic grumbled. Look, those bandages won't work like a poultice forever. I need to change them out so we can keep that wound clean and not get infected. Don't they make a pill for an infection? They do, but we don't have any. Vic rolled over. Yeah, but the kid will have his back on Planchar in no time, won't he? June opened her mouth to respond with a snippy tone, but that's not what she was here to do. She came to build Vic's confidence back up, not tear him down further. Instead, she put her hand on his head. He was burning up. Vic, do you feel all right? I'm fine. I told you. What did you want? I need some sleep in case we make it back to Planchar. Now don't talk like that. Why not? This is my ship, and I'll talk about it how I like. We're going to make it. Have you seen what the gravitational forces of a black hole can do to a planet, let alone a little ship like this? Vic coughed from the outburst. It's our only shot at making it back in time. It's only a little bet. It doesn't matter. It mattered to you when we took the challenge. Yeah, well, maybe I've had time to think a few things over. That set June back. Vic had never been so upfront before. He'd get defensive or sarcastic, but this, this was new. Take your shirt off. I need to check your bandages. At least that would give her time to process what had just transpired. Vic and thinking weren't two things that always went well together. Vic coughed again and struggled to get out of his shirt. The bandages, soaked with blood and poison, definitely needed changing. June steeled herself for the task. The doctor had shown her what to do, but that didn't make the task any easier. She'd stored fresh bandages in the drawer nearest the bed, guessing that Vic would choose this room to rest in. He didn't know it, but she knew he'd like to be in this room and look outside. It's all my fault, he said abruptly. What? I know it's all my fault. Everything. If it hadn't been for my father, it's not your fault that Joey and I are here. Vic looked up as he spoke. No, but it's my fault we're being chased by the police. It's my fault that Mike joined our crew. It's my fault we're on a tight schedule, and I gave the kid the idea we could make it back, and now he's trying to prove that we can make it back. Chances are we'll all end up dead. Don't talk like that. Joey is really smart. He may be young, but he's got a good head on his shoulders. I know he's a sharp kid, but seriously, June, he's inexperienced. The smell from the removed bandages was rank with infection. The doctor had given Vic a shot, but the wound still oozed badly. She dropped the bloody mess onto the floor. SBX-39 could clean it up later. Oh, the robot wasn't going to do anything. Listen, Vic, you need to stop taking this so hard. Taking what so hard? Vic looked up. 
Everything will be fine once we get back to Planchard. You'll see. Without another word, June finished dressing Vic's wounds, put a fresh shirt on him, and helped him lay back down. Take a nap. You always feel better after a nap. Vic grunted and fell silent. She turned off the light. Joey and Argmont had the cockpit, and she watched how Joey leaned away from the four-armed pilot. She reached inside her outfit and pulled out a pamphlet, a trifold advertisement set in bold letters across the front. Start your own interstellar shipping business. Another dream I won't see happen. I was so close, but I'm going to have to let this one go, too. She turned and looked back at Vic lying on his bed. His breathing had grown irregular, and he looked so helpless. Fighting back tears, she started to tear the pamphlet into little pieces. She'd never have to tell Vic what the little appointment back on Munchkata had been about. Something caught her eye. Just through the semi-transparent hull, stars blinked and came back into focus, but did so rapidly, as if... As if... As if something is passing in front of them. Joey! Argmon! We've got company! Coming in fast! Report from a drone, sir! Finally, good news at last. Sheriff Justice stopped his pacing and strode over to the officer. Report! Actually, we've got a second confirming report as well. We have their course. They made a correction. Oh, they're going through the blockade. No, sir. They're going around the black holes? No, sir. Well, they're not coming back, are they? No, sir. They're on a course to pass close by the black holes. What? It looks dangerous. The ship is too small to pass through there without incident. Where are you going? Sheriff Justice thought to himself. Only one speed existed in space and when you passed into hyperspace, you went as fast as you could. Passing by the black holes wouldn't do you any good. In fact, it could even slow them down. What do you want me to do, sir? Justice blinked. What are the odds of them making it through there alive and intact? The officer punched a few buttons on the console. It looks like they have better than a 10% chance to make it through on their present course. Why? Justice asked himself rhetorically. Well, Junior piped up, uh, I think it's because there's a theory that the gravitational force of a black hole will accelerate a ship, even one that's traveling at hyperspeed. In fact, Junior pulled up a three-dimensional map. If they go around the first, the speed they gain could swing them around, and the second could continue their acceleration, and... Shut up! There is no reason they put their ship at such risk just to go faster! Junior looked up, his mind twisted in thought. Maybe they want to get away? They've eluded us without going faster. Thanks to the pathetic crew I've got. Justice raised his hand to strike an officer with his riding crop, but his hands were empty. He had to go and break his favorite tool. What if they're on a tight schedule? Explain. If they had to get a shipment back to Planchard in an abbreviated time frame... Beer? Are you telling me that someone sent them on an intergalactic beer run and they want it as soon as possible? I have trouble with that one, Junior. Of all the lame brain ideas you've had, that has to be the worst. Idiots. He was surrounded by idiots. Did anyone on the ship even have two brain cells to rub together? No. Strike that. If they did, they'd be dangerous. Sir, GCP Central Office calling. Bad timing. It's being sent urgent on a secure line. Counselor Petrine is demanding an audience. Justice loomed over the officer but didn't respond. Sir, he's sent the request again. He demands an audience. Put it through to my quarters. Junior, come with me and keep this ship right behind the SS Acid Rat. I don't want to lose them because you didn't know what to do. I don't care where they go. You stay on their tail. Do you understand? He didn't wait for an answer. Sheriff Justice knew this wasn't going to turn out well. Sheriff Esconso must have contacted GCP Central Office. The last thing this pursuit needed was unwelcome company. Justice cleared his throat as he pushed the door open to his room and left it open for Junior to close. Put it through. The screen lit up with Petrine's visage. The man appeared irate beyond compare. Definitely he knew what was going on. I have a report that you are no longer in the radio system, but I have also discovered that you are not en route back to your own system. Justice smiled. We're taking the scenic route. Your scene will be more 12 by 12 if you don't return to your own system. Petrine's nose twitched as he talked. I can assure you that as long as we are in the area, we check out a couple of black holes. You can plot our course, if you like. 
It's not too often my crew and I can take a look at two black holes on the verge of colliding. That's not all that will be colliding, I assure you. Make course corrections now and head back to the Bomba system. This insolence will not go unpunished, I can assure you of that. Insolence? I assure you that I am doing nothing wrong. Sheriff Esconso stated otherwise. He said you are on a vengeance pursuit. He said that you are trying to track down the SS Acid Rat. I hope I don't need to state the Galactic Central Point Central Office's stand on you leaving your system. This is your last chance to return to your own system, Sheriff. I will have a cruiser waiting for your arrival, and they will remain with you until such time this office deems you able to patrol your system on your own again. Have I made myself clear? A tick found its way to B.T. Justice's right eye. Perfectly. Justice straightened himself and smoothed his uniform. If there's nothing else, actually there is. Even if the SS Acid Rat is in your system, you are not to arrest them under any circumstances. If I discover that you have apprehended any of its crew or detained the ship in any way, I'll have your badge. Do you understand? The tick twitched Justice's eye again. Yes. Justice stood and waited for the grimacing image of Petrine to fade. Once it disappeared, he turned to Junior. You know that nifty little trick the SS Acid Rat pulled on us? Junior's jaw fell in amazement. They were interrupted by an officer over the con. Sheriff, a drone has taken pursuit of the SS Acid Rat. Perfect timing. Order the drone to lock on and stay in constant contact. Also, I want to prepare a special drone to send to Bomda. Junior is on his way to explain everything. Junior headed to the door. Where do you think you're going? But you said... I need a hamburger first. You've been listening to VNA Shipping, written and read by J.R. Murdoch. For more information about this podcast and its author, please visit ofgnomesanddwarves.com. VNA Shipping is released under a Creative Commons Attributions Only Non Commercial No Derivatives Works 3.0. Feedback can be sent to jrmurdoch at ofgnomesanddwarves.com, or you can find me at Twitter or Facebook as J.R. Murdoch. There's a lot of podcast fiction out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this one.